Hey Gear Seekers, I'm Nick. This is a brand new SSD NAS from QNAP called the H574TX. It's got Thunderbolt 4, 10 gigabit ethernet, and allows you to install up to five drives in it. But it's got a few interesting quirks that I wanna to talk to you guys about. And I wanna show you who this NAS is actually designed for, because it might not be obvious from the jump, but it has a very particular target audience. And it might be for you, but is the price for you? That's what we're gonna find out in today's video. Let's do a storage thing, because you guys have asked for it. First things first, is the H574TX fast? It's pretty dang fast. We did a couple tests here. First, let's take a look at the network transfer speed using Crystal Disk Mark in Windows. And you can see here that we're basically maxing out the 10 gig link across our network to the NAS. So there's nothing unusual about this. And we also decided to test a typical file transfer. In fact, these are video files from the video that you're watching now on the ingest station. This transfer here is from the NVMe M.2 SSD drive that we typically shoot video to. And you can see here that we're maxing out the speed of the drive in the enclosure itself. So again, very, very fast. Now, this is a disk speed test using Thunderbolt 4 in macOS. And this one is similar to Crystal Disk Mark, but it's not as configurable. So we can't change it to the exact same Q depths and doesn't give us the exact same representation of what those speeds would be, but you can get a good idea of what's going on here. You can see that we're getting close to the throughput of PCIe Gen 3 by 2 which is what all of these drives are capable of in this NAS. Now, here is the last one that you might find interesting. This is the Blackmagic disk speed test, and this test is typically used to show what a drive is capable of when you're editing a certain type of footage directly from it. And as you can see here, we've only got one limitation and it's really with some high res pro raw stuff, but beyond what you can shoot anyway at this point in time. And even if you're shooting in 12K and you're using the Blackmagic Ursa 12K, you'll be shooting in B-Raw, not in ProRes. So I would say that, you know, the file transfer speeds here and the usability is more than adequate for most people's workflow with the benefit with Thunderbolt 4 being that you can do both of those transfers at the same time because of the extra bandwidth. And it's pretty unlikely that there will be an occasion where you'll fully saturate this with more than two people using it anyway. Realistically, if you're looking at something like this for your workflow in a situation where you need more than three or four computers connected to this device, then you're gonna look at something else, not this. However, I suspect that this would still be up to the task without any issues whatsoever. The version of the H574TX that I got here is the 12 gig version. And the difference between the two variants are the CPU, and the memory. So like I said, this has got 12 gigs of RAM. 12 gigs for a device like this may be up for debate because this uses ZFS. Now, QNAP has slowly been transitioning from EXT4 to ZFS over the last few years. And I think that is a good choice because realistically, if anything happens to this enclosure and you need to pull the drives out and maybe you don't want to buy another QNAP, Technically, you should be able to import the pools into something like TrueNAS, but that's a whole nother video for a whole nother topic for a whole nother day. In terms of the CPU inside the model that I've got here, which is the 12 gig version, this is the Intel Core i3 1320PE. This has four performance cores, four efficiency cores, and 12 threads. This is a perfectly adequate CPU for a device like this. Again, that could be up for debate with whether or not it is, but given how storage was, not that long ago. This is more powerful than a lot of other storage controllers. So yeah, it's small, it's efficient, and I get it. I get the CPU choices for devices like this. Low power consumption when idle, because if you have a device like this, you're not smashing it all of the time. It's really there to be accessible when you need something for whatever it is you're working on. And 
something I'll come back to. As for the 16 gig version, it uses the Intel Core i5-1340PE, which is slightly different in its architecture. It's got four performance cores and eight efficiency cores. So yeah, there are some variants. Now the main issue is the price differentiation between these models are insane. I'll get the pricing out of the way now. In Australia, you're looking at about 2,200 Aussie dollars for this. And I'll put that US price on the screen now as well. And whatever it ends up being, it's too much for a device like this considering you get no drives with it. And realistically, if you're adding, let's say five, four terabyte drives, you're starting to get into that territory where it can get quite expensive. And this is something I mentioned with the Asus Store M.2 NAS as well, you know it can get prohibitively expensive, especially when the enclosure is almost over a thousand dollars in any case. And then you're going to be spending upwards of a thousand dollars or more for drives. Like in the case for these drives here from Silicon Power, they're over, I don't know, like, yeah, they're, they're expensive, about 1800 Aussie dollars just for drives for this. So you're almost doubling the price just to add drives too. And again, it's hard to argue with the price for the drives because that's just how much they cost but surely they can think about lowering the price for enclosures and NAS devices like this but this kind of leads into who a device like this is for and how you would use it. If you're new here you might not know this but it's no secret that we have a hybrid workflow here at Gearseekers. For computers that we use we use both Windows and Mac OS for certain tasks. Claire uses both every single day. And for me, I use mainly PC, but also Mac OS when we're on the move. Now, why is this important to talk about with a NAS like this? Well, first of all, the size of the H574TX means that it is extremely portable. Think about it. The series from QNAP is called the NAS book, right? It is the size of a book and it's a portable Thunderbolt 4 enclosure. Now, I think you know where this is going. Yeah, we've got 10 gig ethernet, but if we're traveling to things like Computex and I'm editing and say, for instance, hypothetically, which is actually not hypothetical anymore, which is crazy to think about, we have a second shooter and editor working. We can work off this at the same time as each other with two MacBook Pros plugged in concurrently over 20 gigabit Thunderbolt 4. This kind of leads into who this is designed for. And I think if you're looking at a device like this, th there's a couple uh, prerequisites. First of all, you've got a workflow that requires Thunderbolt 4. Otherwise, there's no real reason to buy this. You could just build something like this yourself and it would probably be close to, if not cheaper, Second of all, the Mac users out there. Now for me, when I'm editing and traveling, the best tool for the job is always the sharpest tool for the job. And the sharpest tool that I found over many years and a lot of experience are these new Apple Silicon MacBook Pros. There's just honestly nothing that comes close to them for editing on the go. I mean, we've made whole videos about this, you know, I'm not like a hardcore PC guy who's like, PC is the way, PC master is. I don't care about any of that. Best tool for the job is the sharpest tool, like I said. Not only that, if I've got another MacBook Pro, like I mentioned, we can do two at the same time. So that, that's what's really important about this. To do stuff like that, you do have to pay a little bit extra for the privilege because you need Thunderbolt 4 cables and these are not cheap. What I think is most important is the rear connectivity on this NAS. We've got 10 gig ethernet, 2.5 gigabit ethernet. We've got HDMI because like most NAS devices that we see from QNAP these days, you can create virtual machines and then use the HDMI port to output directly to that virtual machine. We have a Thunderbolt 4 port and, and also two USB ports. One is a 3.2 port and the other one is a USB 2.0 port. For front IO, because it's got a little bit of it, we've got another Thunderbolt 4 port, another USB 3.2 type A port. We've got this little button here, which you can assign for quick backups and that kind of thing, a power button, activity lights, and 
the magic sauce. This is what makes this really, really interesting. From the get-go, getting into this to install drives may not be that obvious. Essentially, there's this magnetic front plate. There's a little latch to unlock it. I've already unlocked it because I leave this unlocked. Pull that plate off and what you'll see is five drive bays. Now, these aren't just any type of drive bay. This is equipped with five E1S slots. And if you're not familiar with the technology, essentially what it is, is a type of NVMe storage. However, it is a hot swappable version of NVMe and it uses a different connector. To pull any of these drives out, there are these little latches here and you can unclip it and slide these drives out. Inside our QNAP enclosure, we have five of these four terabyte silicon power US 75 NVMe M.2 drives. Now going back to E1S, take a look at the connector on the end. You may not be familiar with it, but essentially this is a E1S connector. Welcome to the world if you've never seen it before. And this is typically used for high density storage in data centers. It is a bit of a new and emerging technology, but like I said, it is really designed to allow you to have hot swappable NVMe storage. But what we're seeing in this sled out of the gate, and this is what is pre-installed, is an adapter. This isn't actually what an E1S drive looks like. I did try to get some E1S drives to show you guys what they look like, but yeah, there's, I just couldn't get them. And they're prohibitively expensive at the moment, so I couldn't buy them, and they're pretty hard to find, so lots of different problems. So what interests me about this is that QNAP decided to use E1S as the standard for this, but I also understand why, because if you have a drive failure, it's much easier just to pull out an E1S drive and swap it out. But keep in mind, if you are using an M.2 drive in this adapter, it is not hot swappable and you could possibly damage your drive hot plugging it. Interestingly enough, with the connectivity itself for each of these slots, these are PCIe Gen 3 by two slots. The reason why they do this is because you're not really sacrificing any speed or anything at, with by two being Gen 3. And also it reduces the amount of required processing power to allow this to work. Now, one thing you might be asking is, what's the reason for these Amazon specials with these heat sinks? Well, there is something I notice with using this enclosure. I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but I've been using this QNAP enclosure for about four months and been really testing it to see if we can integrate this with our workflow because the idea for this NAS is quite good. And believe it or not, this has some advantages over that 12 drive Asus Store M.2 NAS that we checked out last year. Allow me to explain. I've been using this every single day for about four months in different ways. So first of all, when I got this, I didn't have these drives from Silicon Power. Shout out to Silicon Power because it's quite a lot of expensive drives that you guys sent over. I was using some other drives. I had just one terabyte drives to test to see what the file transfer speeds were like and what the deal was with cooling drives in an enclosure like this and really where you could push this thing and what were the limits with it. So one of the first things I noticed was I had the five one terabyte drives that I had sitting in here before while I was testing. If this enclosure was on, and even if I wasn't copying anything to it without M.2 heat sinks, the fans on this would ramp up and it would sound like there was a fighter jet in my office. So that's the first thing I noticed. What I wasn't sure about was whether or not adding M.2 heat sinks would make this thing quieter. We'll come back to that in a minute. The reason why I didn't show you guys what the thermals were with the other drives I had in here was this thing was so loud when I was trying to use it, it just started to piss me off and I just didn't want it to be on at all. So I had it running, we were testing it, we were, I was using it for our workflow and then it would get to a point where the whole thing was just saturated with heat and there was nothing I could do to cool it down and just pissed me off and I turned it off and I thought to myself, if this is how it's gonna be with M.2 drives all the time, Maybe I'm just not gonna use this thing at all, but yeah, we did find a solution, which is nice. 
The other thing I noticed was all the drives that I had in here previously without heat sinks were running in excess of 70 degrees Celsius. Now, here's the thing with flash memory. Sometimes flash memory has an optimal operating temperature because of the way things work with electrons and everything on that scale, right? Believe it or not, some things being too cold is bad. But with M.2 drives in such close proximity to each other, yeah, it just isn't optimal. Now, like I said, it has two system fans. First of all is a CPU fan and the chassis fan. What would happen is with the other drives in here, the whole thing ramps up, it's too loud. You can go in and adjust all the fan curves and the fan speeds and everything in QUTS, but with doing that, it hits a state where it still says, hey, this is too hot and we're just gonna run everything at 100% regardless of the fan profile. So that led me to believe that even though the enclosure has a couple clearance issues, which I'll talk about in a moment, you'll still need to use heat sinks on your drives. The clearance is quite low. Now, typically M.2 heat sinks will be about 15 millimeters and up. And standard ones are about 20 mil. And you've got to think about the bottom clearance underneath the drives as well. Typically with PCIe Gen 4 drives and the newer ones with the newer Pfizer controllers, you will not find any of the memory modules on the underneath of the drive, which is a nice thing because it makes it a bit easier to cool. I had a mini Spore mini PC floating around. In that mini PC, there was a little M.2 heatsink strapped to that drive. And I, I thought, you know what? I wonder if these little things would fit. They use rubber bands to attach. So I put it on one of the drives and tested the clearance. And lo and behold, I had zero clearance issues. So the first lot of issues were solved. The drive with the heatsink on the included sled fits in with no issues whatsoever. The next thing that I wasn't sure of was I've got these drives from Silicon Power. Am I going to be able to cool them? Like, will the heat sinks work without the fans ramping up? Because the idea of this NAS had me intrigued. I went on Amazon. I'll link the M.2 heat sinks in the description. I mean, obviously, you know how this is going to go because I'm still using it with the heat sinks. But yes, these cheap little Amazon heat sinks absolutely did the trick. Now, Silicon Power does make a version of this drive with an included heat sink and whatnot, but the included heat sinks with a lot of these drives are too tall for this enclosure, which is a little bit on QNAP. I mean, we've been getting into working with companies on understanding why they make design choices a lot lately. And I think what QNAP's idea process behind it was, hey, you know what? We've got this new NAS, supports E1S drives. There's an E1S standard with 7.5 mil heat sinks. That's what we're really going to gear it towards. And if people want to use M.2 drives with heat sinks, well, they're going to have to buy our M.2 heat sink kit, which is designed specifically for this NAS, where all they could have done is just made the uh, case a little bit taller. As far as the thermal performance with the drives, here's a little bit of an example, something I wanted to show you guys with just using Crystal Disk Mark fully loading up everything I could and just smashing this thing to show you what happens to the drive thermals and the network throughput. So what we're seeing here is the drives are pinned at 38 degrees. No matter what I'm doing here, no matter what the ambient temperature is in the room, 38 degrees. The best thing about all of this is it's dead silent, it doesn't make a sound and the CPU fans no longer ramp up. So. The moral of the story is if you're looking at using this NAS, I 1 billion percent recommend M.2 heatsinks from Amazon or QNAP's own official solution. But I suspect the Amazon specials will be a lot cheaper. I think they only cost me 20 bucks by the end of it. So yeah, there is that. We've also found that with two people editing a Gear Seekers video with what we primarily shoot as B-roll, we aren't able to saturate the 10 gig link on it either, which is really, really nice to have. As well as that, with Thunderbolt being 20 gig on each port, you, it's very unlikely that you'll saturate it that way as well. So you need to have realistic expectations for devices like this, and it is very, very expensive for what it is. The other thing to mention with the H574TX is its form factor in general. Now, 
I know I spoke about, you know, they could have made it a little bit taller, but when I put this in my server rack, it's a little bit taller than one U. And when I put it on the top shelf in the rack, it kind of fits in perfectly and hides a little bit of the top, but in the server rack in my office where I've got all my editing PCs and all that stuff, you can see that I have the H574 here in my rack because as maybe mentioned through the video, recently, well, at least for the past four months, I've been ingesting all the footage to this NAS and been editing directly off this NAS. So the irony of all of this is the video that you're watching right now has had all the footage sitting on the NAS that's being edited on the NAS and being rendered back to this NAS. Here's the other thing that I think that people have got really confused about with the 574TX, that it's designed to be your primary storage device. It's not, it's meant to be supplemental. It's meant to be the fastest accessible storage for you to do the things you need to do. Take this for example, look how we've got this set up with our workflow. First of all, the way we shoot all of our videos is we use M.2 SSDs and our cameras all support shooting directly to these NVMe drives. And with the computer that I'm at now in the studio, this is our ingest station. It's got 10 gigabit ethernet and whatnot. And instead of me walking over to any of the editing PCs, plugging this in and copying it to a local drive, I plug it into our ingest station and it just copies directly to this over 10 gig, ready to go, ready for editing on any machine on the network, you know? Then what happens to that is all of the projects and all the templates are also on another share on here. So all the scratch disks are also on here. So we've got 20 terabytes of accessible storage. That's M.2, which is very, very quick. And then all of that syncs with the hybrid sync station that QNAP's got as an app you can install, like all the other QNAP apps, you can install that stuff. And we've got a one-way sync setup that basically says, hey, you've got all these new files, new project files, all of these additional project files on this NAS here. We're gonna synchronize it with your true NAS server and make sure that anything new gets added to your true NAS server on spinning rust. So that would be the ideal setup for something like this is transferring everything over with rsync or some type of backup to your other server because then if anything happens you still have it in two places it's not a backup it's just a duplication of the data and the most current stuff now as you can see here on screen the way i've done this because we've been testing this for about four months is midnight every single night any changes made on here gets pushed to our other server so yeah that, that's the ideal solution for that so really what makes something like this accessible and usable for the regular person is you don't need to be an expert to set it up it's a wizard when you plug it in it just sets everything up for you you can set up this with some different raid modes but what i would recommend is forgetting what you know about raid because essentially what qnap's done here is they're using ZFS as the underpinnings and some old terminology to help explain what's going on for people who may know a little bit or enough and they explain it quite well on the wizard. So I have this set up in RAID 5, which means realistically it's RAID Z1. One drive goes down and I can swap it out and we're good to go. So yeah, that's the way I would typically set it up. Here's the other thing with stuff like network settings and whatnot. If you're using 10 gig ethernet and your switching gear can handle it, I would suggest turning on jumbo frames and using a 9000 MTU because it does help with larger file transfers. And basically it makes every network frame larger, which means it should theoretically be faster. You know, this is just something that you learn when you start building out bigger networks, but it can benefit, but these type of things can benefit with small deployments as well. I guess the real question is, would I buy something like this even if QNAP didn't send it to me? And the answer is probably not. Okay, a couple of reasons. First of all, the price, US price, 1200 US dollars. I don't know, seems a bit high. 
2,200 Aussie dollars, which is my local currency, that seems even higher. Uh, even after conversion, that's actually a lot higher. And five drives only is quite a limiting factor for a device like this. Let's say this cost 1,200 US dollars. If it had 12 drives, it would be more attractive to me, but only five, yeah, it's not ideal. Also, I think really, like I've said before, they wanted to keep it this way because of the form factor. Five E1S drives in an enclosure this size, how could they make it any smaller? Or how could they make it any bigger without more drives? Like it's kind of the perfect size. It is about the size of a book, so I get the naming as well. But yeah, I think if you're serious about your storage, uh, you know, maybe not. If you're a content creator who needs storage on the go, that's gonna be really fast. I could almost recommend it. There are other options out there like the Acer store that we covered a little while ago. I'll link to that in the description down below. But yeah, like it is a very hard device to recommend based on the price. The next thing is, will I continue to use this even though it's expensive and it's quite limited with its functionality? Yeah. I am gonna use it because it is really cool and it is really, really handy for our workflow. And like I said, I've been using it for four months. I don't get emotionally attached to devices, but this is ticking a lot of boxes for me and making things a lot easier, especially when my raw footage is accessible without the need for an SSD cache and it's straight on SSD. All right, that's gonna do it for this little bit of a look at the QNAP H574TX. It is an interesting device. It is expensive. If it's for you, I don't know. If it does tick some of the boxes, then go for it. If it doesn't, look at something else. But as with all tech, I can't tell you how to spend your hard-earned money. I can just show you what I got. I'm your boy Nick with Gear Seekers. You peak, we seek. And I'm gonna go plug this back in so I can dump all this footage to this and actually start editing this video because yeah, I do use this thing to edit the videos on the channel. Thanks for watching. Look at this lazy creature just charging up for the day. Oh, hello, Benny, you're so cute today. People don't know that today is probably the cutest day that you've ever had in your life. And like every day you're even cuter. So tomorrow you'll be way cuter. You're just such a beautiful cat to look at. You lay on your little solar charging pad every day to charge up for late night zoomies. Actually, Binny doesn't do late night zoomies. She'll do late evening zoomies. Isn't that right, Binny? Mm, you're just sleeping. I wish everyone could just meet you and understand the level of cuteness that you are. You are legitimately the best cat in the whole world. And only some people know. But you see this dad of yours? You see this dad of yours? He knows you're the best cat ever anyway, despite what anyone says. You are the spottiest dog that has ever lived. And everybody loves you for it. Bye, Benny.